Hi, everyone. I'm Dan from jazzcomposerspresent.com, an online space where composers, musicians, and listeners come together to celebrate the music we love. I'm joined today by Paul Reed, pianist, saxophonist, leader of the Paul Reed Orchestra, and retired director of jazz studies at the University of Toronto and Humber College. Paul is here to show us how to break away from traditional form and structure. We all know that music depends on good architecture. Uh, even though melody, harmony, rhythm, and even orchestration uh, get all the credit, it seems that form does a lot of the lifting, and it's very, a very important part of this. Sometimes it lurks in the background, and you don't notice it too much. Consider the uh, um, jazz standard Witchcraft, written in 1957 by Cy Coleman and Carolyn Lee. It's 40 measures long, and it follows the plan A, B, C, D, A. Music is so logical, so clear and compelling that the underlying uh, architecture goes virtually unnoticed. Oh, by the way, uh, before going much further, I'd like to recommend a couple of archived uh, videos on this forum. And one is Ed Partika's foundational focus uh, video, Reform, and uh, Tara Davidson's video concerning roadmaps. I watched both of them and I thought they were both fantastic and they are a great um, adjunct to this, uh, to this particular lesson. So form can be small, large. It can also be complex or simple. We all know. Uh, here's three examples uh, uh, just to clarify. As a short form, Let's have a look at Bill Stewart's 7.5. And here it is. It's recorded on um, Chris Potter's live album, Lift. Uh, it's a remarkable album. And when you first listen to this, you might think it sounds like a three-legged chair. You know, it just, you have to get used to it. But it is such a wonderful vehicle for them to use in this performance. Uh, this little transcription is just grabbed from the internet. I'm not too crazy about the notation, but it can sh it shows you the basic structure. Okay, the second one is a long example, and this is Ravel's Bolero, which most of us know. And you can see right away, this is a long melodic arc. Uh, this isn't even the complete melody through the first iteration. And he did this as an experiment, and it works because a, over the long arc, he uh, increases orchestration, uh, volume, density, and it sure works, doesn't it? <laughs> the, uh, uh, the, the popularity of this piece uh, is a, a test to that. And then uh, the third example, I'm going to refer to a more complex example, which is Miho Azama's Dancer in Nowhere from her recording of the same name. Now, this was analyzed in Richard Lawn's uh, excellent text, Jazz Scores and Analysis, Volume 2. In that, he breaks down the piece into a couple of tables. So we can see those. Uh, and you can see right away that we have a little bit of a, a lot. First of all, there are more sections, subsections within the form. He notes that it can be broken down into A, B, A, B, A, but you don't really, at least I don't, when I listen to it, I don't hear that necessarily. But what I do get is that it is so coherent, even despite the complexity of this piece. And uh, I really recommend both volumes of Richard Lawn's Jazz Scores and Analysis. Here, here comes my the crux of things here. I just want to talk about how one can build form and the result can be maybe non-conforming, which is uh, sometimes a desired effect. I like to think of this as writing from the inside out versus the outside in. And what I mean by that is that writing from the outside in is where you have an established form. And it can be AABA, it can be the standard jazz, big band, 
you know, you write an intro with the head, you get some blowing, and then you add backgrounds, and then you have a shout chorus, etc. That uh, is an example of writing from the outside in. And you add detail, and you, do, you fill it out as you go. From the inside out, uh, you can re you can actually produce something that you don't expect when you start working. And this is where you start with a detail, a motive, some sort of little germ of an idea that you're going to expand on. And um, this, uh, this brings me to a piece that I composed uh, to illustrate this. Uh, I wrote it in 1999. And I was commissioned to write a piece for a memorial concert for my friend, Eddie Sawson. He spelled his name E-D-D-I-E. -D -D -E. And I used this spelling of his name to develop a motive. And uh, the first, I, the only general idea I had was that I would write a quiet old first movement, and then I would write a kind of jam session all out have fun second movement. And this is what was called prayer and celebration. Prayer was written specifically starting with a detail and the detail was spell Eddie's first name, E-D-D-I-E. -E. So I wrote E flat, uh, D, D, and then I, I turned it actually into a G, even though maybe A would have been more accurate. You know, you start with the idea and then you, you change it. So it was e, e flat, D, D, G, E flat. And that became the detail I was going to work with and fill out. I had no idea where it was going to go. I'll say there are three stanzas. The first one presents the melody as it developed from this little uh, detail. In other words, from the inside out. And then, as I said, it, after it finishes this first stanza, as it turned out, uh, then I just presented the melody as it had developed again with the saxophone section only. Um, with uh, I added flugel doubling the lead alto and the human voice soprano, and uh, so uh, that added weight, much the same as bolero. And then uh, the final stanza of the, th of the three um, is the full ensemble and I modulated up a, a, a full step. And modulations obviously add interest. Going up is not the only option, but I opted for uh, going up to F major, and I thought that uh, worked reasonably well. of this movement was not preconceived. It came from just that first spelling of E-D-D-I-E. -E. And, um, and I wanted the harmonies not to just be changes, you know, in the standard sort of way. So uh, uh, 
having three stanzas kind of reminded me of being a church when I was a kid, you know, and it, this is something that could relate maybe, you know, to the somberness of the event. And then it goes into celebration, which I won't play. Incidentally, performed there by the Ron Collier Jazz Orchestra at the concert. That was that was the live recording, um, and I played piano on that. Um, the re, the the released recording was done by the Paul Reed Jazz Orchestra with David Braid playing piano. I didn't write to a standard form at all, and I think that sometimes working from the inside out can produce forms you don't expect. Thanks for watching today's mini lesson. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe. Drop any questions, comments, or suggestions for future videos down below. To watch our full-length events and participate in live Q&As with our presenting artists, head to jazzcomposerspresent.com. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.